Now, as you all know, uh, herbicide resistance is an, is an issue. I think we started about uh, to talk about this in what, in the late 80s, early 90s. It was sort of a freak thing then and uh, never thought it would become that widespread. But now it's, it's, it's a big issue and it's something that is not going to go away. So uh, if you just uh, look through this, like at this stage, we have 150 herbicides covering 20, 21 herbicide groups to which uh, resistance has developed. Now, they're basically all herbicides at risk. You know, in a long time we thought glyphosate wasn't, but that's no longer true. The, in Canada, we have 59 herbicides, there are 59 herbicide resistant weeds. No, and in Alberta, we have uh, 11, at least 11 at this stage. Now, uh, was it three or four years ago, we had uh, for the first time uh, glyphosate resistant kosher reported. Now that was a, a big thing here because we had not had any glyphosate resistant uh, weeds up to that point. And of course, kosher is not like a insignificant weed either. Right? So glyphosate resistance is a, is a much bigger issue though in, in Ontario. At this stage, we have uh, uh, three, of, actually four weeds, four weed species that are resistant. A can of fleabane is one of them and it's, 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 it's actually quite exceptional in the level of resistance that it has uh, developed to glyphosate. Uh, there's also giant ragweed and common ragweed, as well as annual sow thistle. Now these are all weeds that we do have here in, in Alberta. Now uh, you may not be that familiar with the ragweeds, they're not as, as aggressive as they are in, in, in eastern Canada and in the Midwest, but they're present here and they, uh, they could uh, become more of a problem as uh, the climate warms up. And Canada fleabane, of course, is something that we do have quite common here as well, right? especially in, in the wetter years, like we have seen over the last five years. There's a lot of, of that coming. Uh, in the bottom of the page, you have a map of, uh, the, uh, of a survey that was done on uh, kosher resist, uh, glyphosate resistant kosher. Uh, so these, the red dots show the locations where it was uh, confirmed. And I just want to add to this, uh, last spring we had another location in Acadia Valley that uh, was also confirmed for, co uh, for glyphosate resistant kosher, which is now one of the more, well, I think in, in Alberta, the most uh, northern location we have so far. So what to do about this uh, is, uh, of course, you have heard it all. You need to rotate, not just your crops from the disease perspective, but also from uh, the perspective of managing these uh, resistant weeds. So you rotate your herbicides, that's one thing. But the other thing you need to do is, and that's something that we have uh, begun to realize as, as even more important, is to mix your herbicide groups. Now you know that herbicides are organized by groups depending on their mode of action. So a different group has a different mode of action. When you uh, do a rotation, what you do is basically you, you apply one treatment to a population of weeds one mode of action, and that in, in itself con constitutes a selection pressure. Right? So there could be some resistant uh, plants being selected for. Now you move to a different group, so that pr pressure is removed, and those plants that may be resistant are again uh, diluted with the rest of the population. So the longer that rotation lasts, the more dilution occurs, and uh, the less those few resistant individuals in the population are of significance. However, they, can, they may well, well be there. Now, when you uh, do mixing, so you're applying uh, two or more herbicide groups at once. And, and I, I'm thinking of mixing by mixing different groups, not just uh, different products within the same group. Right? So what you do there is, um, it's a little bit analogous to a, a password. Right? If you have, think of a password that has only, uh, say, one letter in it, well, then the, there's, that's fairly easy to break. So you add another letter and it's much more difficult to break because there, there's many more combinations and so on. So by mixing, that's what you do. You make it much more difficult to actually, uh, for that resistance to actually show up in the first place. Right. So that's the message here, uh, both mix and rotate. Right. Now, uh, before I move on to the next, uh, hand out there. Are there any questions about this? No questions. All right, that's good. So I'm going on to this handout and this is a, 
a project that I've become involved with over the last uh, uh, close to two years now. It's something uh, that's um, well totally new to me. Uh, at the time, uh, I had someone. It actually, uh, Jan uh, Salut from uh, JC Aerial. He came to me in my office and he said, "Well, I have this uh, little airplane here, and I'm trying to take pictures." And yet, he had shown me some pictures that he took down here with Ken Coles and uh, and so on. I thought, "Well, you know, I, that's something of interest uh, for weeds." And I started thinking about this and how we could potentially use this and. So we start to uh, put together a project, and uh, the goal there is uh, listed down here is basically we want to develop a protocol for how to uh, do use this for field scouting. You know? So uh, at this stage, many people are using it sort of an, as on an ad hoc basis to, to look at the fields, look at the pictures, and see what they can see. But it, the purpose of this project is to develop a more of a um, a full uh, integrated protocol, you know, with a, with a, with a mind what the actual product is going to be and what is this going to look like and what else is needed, you know, how far is the technology really there, and then uh, secondly also to look at the economics of this. Is, is this a, a viable business, say, for a consultant to get into? Is it really of enough value to justify the cost and so on? Now, if you want to turn the page, there are uh, basically uh, two uh, approaches to this. You know, you've seen a lot of people having these small unmanned aerial vehicles. I maybe should say a few things about those first. There are uh, basically two types. There are small model airplanes, so we call them fixed wing. And then there's the other ones that are um, with uh, like small helicopters with more than usually four or, or six or eight rotors. Right. So the the airplane the fixed wing ones they are particularly useful for flying at, at perhaps at high elevations and doing larger areas right and the 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 hexacopters the multicopters they're they're really uh, amazing how stable they are how uh, they can fly to specific spots you know, and they they're easy to land they land right in front of you you know you don't have to it's not like an, a fixed wing airplane you, know, you have to find a a landing a spot to land it and then they hope that everything goes right and it doesn't hit anything and so on so uh, they are they have different uses and the uh, limitations with regard to the technology at this stage is uh, that uh, it's the, the time they can uh, fly the, the, the ones that are used nowadays mostly are battery powered and of course as you know batteries don't last that long so uh, usually the flight times are less than 15 minutes. 15 minutes is stretching it for most. Now, having said this though, there are a lot of uh, efforts going into extending those uh, flight times. Now, we are, there are, there's equipment now out there that can do a half an hour and even more. So uh, that, is, that is changing. And so is the whole technology in that area. It's, it's a rapidly developing field. You just have to go to the, to the web, you know, look it up uh, under UAV or or drones or field scouting for drones for field scouting or something like that you'll find lots of information now with the with the um, the aerial uh, photography that we're taking we're, we're trying to develop maps of fields right? not just uh, sort of an ad hoc approach but we want to develop maps that can be downloaded and then passed on to a producer uh, and kept for records as well to, so that you can use those same those images year after year just as, as a for record keeping purposes, but also to better understand what's going on in the field over time. Uh, in order to generate these maps, we uh, use uh, well cameras, of course, and we, these images are stitched together. We, uh, we use uh, infrared uh, cameras, or uh, cameras that are equipped with a filter to, to uh, measure the infrared, and not just uh, the normal red, green, and blue. Right? The infrared, the thing with the infrared is that uh, vegetation uh, reflects infrared more than it reflects the other colors, including green. Right. So what the advantage of the, this is that the infrared shows vegetation better than it shows other things, and you also get you maximize the contrast between vegetation, actively growing vegetation, and uh, the soil background or, or anything else that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, uh, photosynthesize basically. Right. So uh, that uh, gives you uh, um, um, b in, in improves your ability to just see what's what's going on in a field in terms of differences in uh, growth and vigor and, and so on. Now, on uh, 
page three of the handout there, what, it, what I'm trying to illustrate is, is how, how this is, what this means in practice. First of all, you see that the image has sort of a, a reddish tone to it. The, the, that red is the uh, near infrared, which is uh, the, uh, the green vegetation in this image. So this is an image of a, of a potato field taken at the beginning of June. At that time, the potatoes were just uh, emerging. And you can see there is, uh, well, we had uh, typically about 120 images taken per, f per quarter section that have to be stitched together. And then once they're stitched together, they have to be uh, rectified so that the measurements, uh, the, the dimensions of the image correspond to actual uh, dimension on the ground. So right, you can then use them like, like you would use a map. And, and those images are then put into a GIS and we can work them with them as, as you would with a map. The um, following page, on this page here, you see uh, the, the difference between um, the images taken with the uh, near-infrared camera. And then the middle image is uh, on, on the left side there shows the, that, that same image modified so, to, so as to show uh, basically green. So it, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're substituting the near-infrared with the green uh, so as to uh, make it more natural. Right? So, but it's still the three channels, the three color channels. So you have the near infrared, and you have the the, uh, the blue and, and the green. Right? So the, the that is uh, then the bottom channel. The, the bottom image is different in that sense. The, the bottom image has only the uh, a calculated uh, value for for the uh, calculated based on on the the near infrared and the blue. So this is called the uh, the Vegetation, it's a, it's a vegetation in, index and it's a, a, a different, it's, it's calculated as a ratio of the near infrared over the near infrared and uh, another channel added to it. So what you get is it's just a, a value between minus one and plus one. And this is then, a, 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 and then a color value or a color ramp is assigned to that. And so this is how this ends up being between red and green. Where green is the highest value plus one and, and Red is the lowest value, minus one. Now it also coincides, of course, we choose the ramp so as to make it as uh, intuitive as possible. So the green is actually also vegetation. So uh, this again, this is the, the image that is the most useful in terms of interpretation for the uh, agronomic uses. Now in, in most situations, that's what you, you want because you can see the vegetation there. And, and you see there the, the magnified area uh, this is at 100% uh, zoomed in, so you can see the actual green areas where the potatoes are showing up. And the, um, as opposed to the other images up, the, up there, you see them as well, the, the potatoes. But the green spots on the, the bottom image on the right, they are areas where there is more vegetation than uh, typical. So these are the areas of interest. The question is, at that time, we were interested in seeing if there is any, any weeds. You know, we, detecting weed patches basically and uh, this with this uh, image we could uh, detect uh, some weed patches as you will see on the on the following page right now when it comes of course to detecting weed patches uh, resolution matters and as you know if when you walk through a field uh, in, in the spring you see weeds here and there and uh, that doesn't necessarily form a weed patch and of course you may still have to spray even if there aren't any patches with this uh, kind of uh, camera that we're using our resolution is uh, six um, centimeters to the pixel and that's when we're flying at about uh, 600 feet in the air right so uh, six centimeters to a pixel doesn't uh, allow you to detect uh, small seedlings that are not grouped together in a patch right however that that's a limitation but nevertheless uh, it, it allows you it's good enough to detect weed patches though now uh, the following pages have uh, Similar images, you know, the same uh, thing with uh, in, in an alfalfa field. You now we see um, this alfalfa field is an established uh, seed alfalfa field, and that was uh, cultivated to uh, for two reasons, basically to help with the weed control a little bit and mostly to thin it out, because with seed alfalfa you want a relatively thin stand, right? And uh, there is, uh, it was quite easy to spot the stand, the areas in the field that had, uh, where there were some issues, you know, where the stand was uneven or where there was some winter kill and, and that, and which was uh, quite a problem this year. And the, the last uh, 
picture, the last page shows a um, canola field. Uh, same thing there. We, we, we are able to detect patches, but we're not able to detect uh, uh, individual seedlings. So, um, so as far as then uh, the usefulness for that purpose concern is concerned, uh, it's uh, it's limited for detecting weeds in the spring. Uh, using uh, these uh, this type of, uh, of equipment, uh, flying high over the field and, and trying to, to, to generate a map based on uh, on those uh, stitched images. However, another approach to this could be you could use a, a hexacopter, you know, and and actually sample the field rather than uh, go and try to develop a, an NDVI map as we did here, right? And with sampling, with that approach, it's uh, that's a little uh, still a little uh, into the future because if you were to sample a field, let's say you go over a field and you take images at a low elevation, say it's just a few meters above the soil, and you would uh, then uh, process those images now. Uh, just to cover a, a quarter section, you may have to take, um, oh, maybe say t 2,000 uh, uh, images or so. You know, quite quite a few images to look at. So that is, of course, uh, not practical, and you would have to have a a way to automatically uh, uh, analyze those images for for weeds, and that's still uh, within the future. What we can do in, with existing algorithms at this time is we can differentiate the crop from weeds. No, uh, we can uh, identify certain weeds. You know, we could identify grass in broadleaf weeds. We could identify certain broadleaf weeds that are quite relatively easy to identify. But uh, when you're having uh, uh, weeds that are uh, mixed together, you know, that's where it's still. Uh, so to reliably do this and uh, identifying by species, that's still not. Uh, we're not quite there yet. But uh, it, it's it's certainly something that people are working on, and uh, that's not. Not impossible. I, I think that will happen within a few years. Now, as far as we as diseases is concerned, we run into the same issue. Some things are easily um, uh, detected with an NDVI map when you have patches, right? Now, other things are uh, where you have a sort of a, like often you have with foliar diseases. It's throughout the field. It's fairly uniform, and you wouldn't see a patch. And in that case, uh, we, the same approach as I just mentioned with the, the weeds may be required which may be uh, uh, useful, but again, for each of these things, you'd have to develop specific uh, ways to do this. If you're dealing, it's quite different identifying weeds than identifying, say, um, uh, yeah, lesions on, on, on foliage. You know. So uh, it's something that uh, we're, we're contemplating on and, and hopefully we'll be developing further in the future. Uh, insects, yeah. Cutworms are easily identified because they make nice big patches. Now, uh, other insects, we were, gonna, we're, talking, we're thinking about adding a sweep net to a hexacopter. <laughs> well, <laughs> these hexacopters, the, the good ones, are fairly expensive, so that is a little risky, and we don't have the money for that right now. But <clears throat> well, there are options, so there's all sorts of things you can come up with. Any questions or things you would like to point out? Unfortunately, I don't have anything to demonstrate. Uh, we had them, uh, Jan was here at, uh, about a month ago, right? In June, there was a demonstration. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, if you're interested, look it up on the internet. There's lots of information. Well, join me in thanking Chris.